have uh, received lots of Slack messages. So things are starting to happen. So we passed the ad drop period. Third week, four, fourth week, we're setting things up. And things hopefully will become a bit clearer. So you've gone through the syllabus. You've done the syllabus quiz. I think most of you, these two, still chasing. Um, so by now you have a good idea of what this course is about. You're working on your team contracts, which is supposed to be handed in tomorrow. You had some good examples that you uh, could follow through a link in the syllabus. Hopefully that got you, gave you some ideas, got you going. So this means that by now you've kind of like mapped out all the tasks for this course. So these seem to be like the upcoming tasks. So you have a team contract. There's a chapter that you need to do. I'll go over this uh, now together with you. And then uh, we'll be designing our own intervention. So the chapter that you're assigned to is actually the kind of intervention that I would like you to construct with your team to try and do the best that you can based on the top-notch state-of-the-art evidence that we have. How do we evaluate evidence? How do we know that something works? What are interventions? How to influence people? What's the difference between findings in the lab and findings in the field? So we'll be discussing even more of that today. We started last week a little bit uh, with influence. A lot of uh, doors with foot and face and all that, uh, trying to compare. So how do we know which one works better? How to contrast different effects together? How to make sense of what seems to be reliable evidence and what isn't? Uh, one, one request that I have following up on last uh, week, uh, every week after you go and continue with your classes, I have the cringe moment of having to edit myself and putting the videos up online. It's very difficult. I don't know if you've ever done this <laughs> to record yourself and then watch yourself with body language, with the way that you talk. It's, uh, it's difficult. But one of the good things is that you get to learn a lot about yourself. So I learned that I make a lot of mistakes and I say a lot of silly things that you never correct me on. <laughs> so my request to you is that if I don't answer your question, just a second, if I say something that doesn't make any sense, or you realize at some point that needs to be corrected, I'm um, asking you, urging you, begging you <laughs> to please let me know. I think for some reason, especially in this cultural context, uh, we don't think it's appropriate sometimes to question the professor. I want you to question me. I want you to tell me what's wrong. I think I've showed you this before, but I'll show you this again now. There is a section on my website where I'll pay you. <laughs> to tell me that I'm wrong. So if you go on my website and you'll go to the section that says uh, check me, replicate me, you'll see that I give bounties. So I offer money <laughs> between five US dollars and 50 US dollars. If you find a mistake that I've done in my papers or something small, a minor one, five US dollars, a big one in my papers, 50 US dollars, there's something about me that needs correcting, I am very, very happy to know that I'm wrong. I think it's very important in this process that we all understand that we're all human beings. We know that, we have weaknesses. Therefore, I need your help. So if I confuse, uh, let's say, door in the face to foot in the door or something like that, it happens because my mind is like racing with a, a million other things. And please let me know, I am interested. Now, I've, I've noticed quite, quite a few, yeah. Uh, sometimes I like react, uh, yeah, wrongly to the, and then I take it away from the video, and then you know the public record is clean, and then I feel like I haven't corrected myself to you. But if I catch myself, I will, I will let you know. But I do feel like sometimes, at least watching the video and hearing your responses, that you know that what I'm saying is not accurate. So I'm just asking you, really. It's it's uh, it's for me very very important that we have like a direct communication on this. So if you ever want to work with me on something, scientific articles, if you happen throughout your chapters to go through some of the work that I do and you realize something is wrong, please let me know. 
I will compensate you for that and be very thankful. Put your name, credit, and everything. All right, so here's a bit about uh, where we are. So starting from next week, actually, it's, uh, we're not going to meet uh, for two weeks now, which is completely ridiculous in the middle of the semester not to meet for two weeks. Just as we're starting out, suddenly you disappear. So next week is a public holiday. The week after that is a reading week. Never heard of reading week before I came to HPU. Interesting. You get a break. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Um, research, I guess. But then it was two weeks that we don't see uh, each other. However, I'm still asking you to do a weekly reading. So this is part of the uh, weekly readings. Uh, this is now 25% of your score. So I wanted to balance a little bit more the individual parts and the group parts so that you feel uh, hopefully a little bit more comfortable. And as you'll see in the, in the syllabus, it puts out everything quite clearly, but there's a lot of choice. So it's not like week five is this reading, week six is this reading. The purpose of the readings is to ignite your interest, is to get you interested in things related to the course. And because you have a lot of tasks, actually you can select the readings that are related to your task. Some of them are about influence, some of them are about nudging, some of them are about intervention, some of them are coming to So all sorts, of, all sorts of interesting things that might help you. So I would just want this to be a process of you learning how to learn rather than following what the professor is, is saying. So there's lots of uh, chapters that I chose from uh, different uh, books. If you like the style, then you're of course welcome to look at the entire book. So do you have book chapters? You have podcast episodes, and then you have TED Talks, and games or tasks that you're... All I'm asking is that you, every week, you change, you try something different. So if you did a book in the first uh, or week five, then do a podcast, week six, just like uh, change it uh, a bit. I'm not, uh, it's up to you completely what it is that you want to do. Um, but for each one of those, as you'll see here, I'm asking you, please write your, you know, replace my name with your name and then answer things like, what is the main thing that you learn? Practical takeaway, biggest positive, biggest caveat. How effective is this reading? You know, don't need to go too much into this. Just like give me a number of what it is that you think about this reading. What questions do you have? And then please give me the date that you completed this and how long it took you. If after a while I see that it's taking you too long, um, then I will do something about it. But generally, the aim is for this to take about 30 minutes. So 15, 20 minutes for you to watch a TED Talk or read a chapter, and then about uh, 10, 15 minutes for you to reflect on this. The reflection is one, two sentences for each question. I don't want you to start like entire essays. This is not the point. The point is to expand your horizons, to gain some knowledge, and then show me that you've processed this, that you reflected on this. and uh, did something with this, yeah? So I don't want you to, to go into too much detail, but it is to show me that you've read this. Obviously, many students can choose the same kind of reading. That's completely okay. Uh, I want you to be able to see what the others are doing. This is why it's like this and not individual submissions. I want you to learn from each other. I want you to, if, if you want to, comment on each other, communicate with each other. I'm even okay with you like in the same team going for the same reading and then discussing this among, amongst yourselves. It's completely okay. How you learn is up to you. I just want to know that you're learning. I want to see the choices that you're making. I want to see the process that you're going through. So answer these things. And then in the main table, just indicate, you know, week five, your name, whatever it is that you chose, just indicate this every week so that we can keep track of this. Any questions about this uh, task? What needs to be done? The weekly reading? Yeah, so aim for like half an hour per week to invest in this. If you see that it's taking you longer, then just stop. You know, it's okay to stop mid chapter, mid TED talk, mid. Okay, after 15, 20 minutes, stop, move on to the reflection. It's not supposed to overwhelm your time. It's not supposed to get you into this endless loop of over investing. It's just supposed to have half an hour a week for you to reflect about something that is 
hopefully fun and interesting related to this course. And then when we talk about things in class, then hopefully there's going to be a little bit more of a discussion because you can bring something that you've learned. You can end. I will read your questions. If it's interesting and relevant, then I will discuss this in class. Okay? Okay, good. How about the book? So hopefully this will also help you with the book. So the book is Influence, Persuasion, Behavioral Change for Doing Good. We did a little bit of that in the previous week, talking about all these uh, influence techniques, how effective they are. But generally, we, you've been assigned, your teams have been assigned to different topics, defaults. We'll talk about defaults today. Social proof, social norms, matching schemes, pledges and pre-commitments, social and public, persuasion techniques from last week, framing effects, and anchoring effects. So overall, eight different techniques. Uh, and our aim is to look at the best evidence. So we have an uh, uh, in-depth report, best psychological science evidence, real-life case studies, real-life ca case studies of success and of failure, and then possible applications for doing good, where our main aim is to increase charitable donations to help others contribute a bit more. So today we'll cover a bit of the nudge-related so the thing is that next week, or next time we meet, three weeks, uh, you will know a lot more about your topics, and then I will actually show you some of the best evidence. So after we've covered all the basics, I'll show you like how we address things uh, during COVID, vaccination, social distancing, some of the best evidence, and how it's apply applied in mega studies, um, what, what we actually do with this. So hopefully, the third task, or the second task, is the one where you're actually going to do an intervention, and we'll try to get people to, to donate, donate more. <clears throat> yeah, so the second one, yeah, applying findings to show social challenges. You'll be constructing an intervention, and actually, I'll run this intervention using some funding that I got for this teaching. So that, that's something to look forward to. Course summary, if you haven't already, there's lots of reasons for you to do this course summary. Please go and have a look. I think uh, so far I've seen some people do some good, good work there. This is our um, public folder. So all the lectures and the videos are over there. This is our syllabus, weekly readings, and writing a book together about best evidence for doing more good, doing good better. OK. So. I have a lot of slides here. Some of those I did by myself, but many of those I borrowed from others who have made this uh, very nice of them to make this publicly available. So if you want to know more, you can go over there. Uh, familiar with this guy? Who is this guy? How many of you know this guy? No? The previous class here was uh, economics. So this is the business school here somewhere close. We're very lucky in psychology that we have the, the nicer buildings. Uh, they're here. Typically, the business schools kind of uh, take over the, the good buildings. So they're very familiar with this. So he's an economist. But the interesting thing about R Richard uh, Thaler is that the uh, so University of Chicago, he actually joined two psychologists that we talked about, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. And uh, he left the economist uh, line. University of Chicago is Nobel laureates, very, very famous for a lot of things in classical, neoclassical uh, economist uh, views. And he went against them by joining forces with psychologists to start what has later become behavioral economics or judgment decision making. So Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky are psychologists or based in psychology coming into economics. but He's one of the economists, the very few economists that went from economics into psychology, combining the two. You can see a little bit of the impact. I think we talked about H index and I, I ten. So you can see he's very impactful. He's done quite a lot. And he's very, he's very well known in the world for winning the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2017. So when he won, so Daniel Kahneman, psychologist, won in 2002. And then it took another 15 years for behavioral economics to get another recognition from uh, economics. 
by having him win the Nobel Prize. What, what did he win the Nobel Prize for? A lot of things, but most of them is for the concept. Some people call this a theory. I don't know if this is a theory. The concept of nudge. So uh, we'll talk about nudge a lot today. And uh, I have a lot of interesting thoughts about uh, Richard's uh, approach and views on, on nudge. But first, I'll let him introduce nudge to you. And then we can discuss about what you think about nudge. I want you to pay close attention to how he describes nudge. And I want you to especially put the scientist hat and try to think about this as a scientific evidence approach to how do we test this? How do we define this? And I want you to think about uh, possible weaknesses in the way that this is described. So every case study, every example that he gives or the definition that he gives, I want us to talk about some of the weaknesses and perhaps how we can improve on those weaknesses. I'm Richard Thaler, professor of economics and behavioral science at the Graduate School of Business at the University of Chicago, and co-author of the new book, Nudge, with Cass Sunstein, a professor at the University of Chicago Law School. Nudge is any small feature in the environment that attracts our attention and influences the behavior that we make. Nudging is done by what we call a choice architect which is a fancy term for anyone who influences the choices that you make. Take the example of the cafeteria downstairs. Somebody had to decide where to put the salad bar, where to put the burgers, where to put the ice cream, where to put the coffee. That person is a choice architect because the arrangement of the food influences the choices that we make. So for example, in our cafeteria, you have to go by the salad bar to get to the burgers. That increases the chance that you're gonna go for the salad, which is a good thing. So another domain in which we see nudges is in safety. There's a beautiful road here in Chicago called Lakeshore Drive, and there's a dangerous S-curve right downtown where people are constantly wiping out. So what the city's done is painted lines on the road and as you drive up to the most dangerous part of the curve, the lines are closer together, which gives you the illusion that you're speeding up, so you tap the brake and slow down, which is exactly what you want to do. You've been nudged. So what's your understanding of nudge? How would you summarize nudge? What are some of the key concepts that he mentioned? Right. So we are choice architects. We are able to influence something in the context by which people make choice. Nudge is anything in the environment that is able to influence whatever choices that we make. Any other features, any other uh, clarifications to this? Like, for example, in this uh, safety video that you saw with the marks on the road, what is that? How is this a nudge? Makes you feel like you're speeding up, yeah? So what is this intended for? Thank you so much. Okay, so we have like a desired uh, behavior, which counteracts something that people are doing. So people are behaving in a bad way that causes them harm. And then we come in saying, we don't want people to behave this way. So we have a desired outcome for them to slow down. And then we think, what can we do about the choice architecture in order to get them to slow down, right? And then they come up with this solution, right? When you see this kind of, like, I, I don't know if you've seen these kind of interventions on the street, you've seen these lines, or you've seen the, you know, if you go too much to the side, then it starts uh, rocking or making a, a noise. So th this, this is a nudge. Did you know that this is a nudge? Did you notice these things? First of all, do you see the lines on the road? Do you feel the rocking on the side? 
when you when you you do you do see that you do experience that but you're not familiar with this being a nudge right so what makes this a nudge rather than just making this like good design what's the difference between good design and a nudge yeah so with with good design what would be different Let, let's reiterate what is the salad thing what is the salad thing yeah, so you're saying somebody could have put the salads there without intending for this to be a nudge. At what point did this become an actual nudge? This is what you're saying. That's a good point. Um, who, who, let's take the salad example. Who usually tries to influence the choices or what we do when we go and eat a burger or a salad and get some food? Who usually cares about the restaurant? What, why do they care? What, do they, what are they trying to do? Yeah, get you to spend more. How to do that? Okay, more options, more choice. So having more things in your face. We can talk about whether this actually increases the sales or not. What, what else? What else can they do? Promotion, marketing in all sorts of different places. Terrific. Great. Anything else? So these examples, are these nudge? You answered quite quickly, means that your intuition tells you that it's not, but let's try and clarify why putting, you know, more, having more choices or getting you to uh, spend more money in a restaurant is not a nudge. What differentiates that from what he said? Yeah, good question. Yeah, a any thoughts about this? What differentiates a nudge from, let's say, the restaurant wanting to do sell more and have more marketing for you as well? <laughs> Marketing versus nudge. Any differentiation between these two? Yeah. Who is trying to profit in this case? Uh, nudging versus, let's say, the restaurant. So he, he pivoted the restaurant versus the choice architecture nudge. What, what does uh, Thaler get from you eating more salads? Yeah. So the general population is healthier if people go for the salad rather than for the burgers, for example. But does he have anything to personally gain from this? Perhaps not. With the restaurants, we know who is intended to profit from this, sometimes at the expense of the customer. Sometimes these things align, and that is terrific. And the market forces, perhaps more people will want to eat salads and be more healthy, but not always. At least comes somebody from University of Chicago and says, I think I know what is the right thing to do. We want people to slow down. We want them to eat a salad. Therefore, we must influence the choice architects in order to get them to do the right choices. And this goes counter to perhaps what the restaurant wants us to do, right? And then we need to, you know, if you do this uh, cafeteria at University of Chicago, you have the ability to tell the contractor, I want my students to be healthy, so design it this way. But if you're the restaurant, like, why would you do this? What's your incentive to do this? Now, I want to show you... Um, an example, and I want you. To, this is this is like a sensitive thing in nudge uh, theory, so a sensitive discussion, and I want to bring it to you for you to tell me what you think about this because this is coming straight from him. So when we ask Richard Tyler, what is the best example for a nudge? What do you think he would give us? The number one example, the most common one in the book. Have any ideas? Any guesses? Prediction? Small dinner place, that would be a good guess, yeah? Health-related stuff, any other guesses? Here we go. <laughs> Unavailable. Let me give you an illustration of a nudge. It's one paragraph in our book, but it's by far the most famous example from the book. It turns out some genius who, an economist in fact, allegedly at least, an economist who works for the Amsterdam International Airport, Schiphol, got the brilliant idea to etch the image of a housefly in the urinals in the men's bathrooms at the airport. This image of a housefly, it looks extremely realistic. You can uh, see a picture of it uh, on our website, uh, nudges.org. 
And um, it's located just near the drain. Now, it turns out that men, when they're taking care of their business, they're not fully attending to the task at hand. But, and I'm sure there's an evolutionary explanation for this, if you give them a target, they will aim. And uh, according to the people who run the airport, spillage has been reduced by 80%. Now, that housefly has become my favorite illustration of a nudge. So this is his favorite illustration of a nudge. Any thoughts about this? I had a lot of questions when I first read this, when I heard him talk about this. Do you have any questions about this example? Only works a couple of times. Oh, very good question. I like this. This is very scientific. How do they measure the spillage? Terrific. Any other questions like that? <laughs> I, I don't even know if like girls, females know this problem of spillage. Are you familiar with something like this? I think this is like men, men's issues, but a little bit cringy also to talk about spillage. Uh, but there is, turns out, under the urinal, almost even in Hong Kong, where things are relatively more clean and cleaned very often, there is some stuff going on over there. Okay, so uh, how do we measure spirit? Can you imagine the person who was responsible for going? What, what do you want to know about spillage? Let's make the scientific amount, spread. What, what else do we want to know about spillage? Let's have more questions like this. What else do you want to know about the study? The staff? Somebody who's cleaning, yes? Yeah? How many people are involved in this? Who ran this? Allegedly a genius by Nobel Prize winning economist, yes? So which, which toilets were used? Yeah, maybe it's a specific path or a chosen toilet, yeah? Uh, random assignment, was this randomly assigned, yeah? Time scale, yeah. I want to know about time scale as well. Yeah. Uh, can you make this a bit more specific? What do you want to know about time scale? How long the experiment lasted? Yeah. You had, to, you had a question? Oh, similar. You wanted to know the time scale? Good. So we have a lot of questions about this. What is the number one figure that we have? He had one figure that he wanted to share with us. What is the intervention strength? 80%. Striking effect, right? If we are able to reduce spillage, um, what what else is it about the actual intervention? So we know what the problem is. We know that we have. We want to know more about how this was uh, evaluated, right? How about the actual intervention? What is the intervention? What do you actually do to the urinal? With the evolutionary explanation, yeah. You give a target, yeah? What is the target in this case? A picture of a fly. I had some questions about this, don't you? Why a fly? Why not, like, if this is a target, just put a target. Why a fly? Would you want to, let's say that this is a live fly, why would you want to aim for that? Where to best place that? Did anybody manipulate what is the best place to do this and measure the spillage? Close to the drain? But maybe some people aim to the right, some people to the left. Do you want to know which side? Yeah, yeah. What is the evolutionary explanation for this being a fly? Let's say that really a man is a target. We can talk endlessly about that. What would be um, more simple, natural? <laughs> thing to use. What would you do in this case? Football and a goal. Yeah. Something that tells you aim here. I don't know if a fly screams at you aim here. Now I honestly thought, okay, maybe in the book, you know, you have editors and editors want to sell. So maybe this is like kind of a thing. And maybe I don't know who interviewed him, what was the I thought maybe this is like a one time thing. A one off. Maybe just like they got him in, a, and this is like 2011 when the book came out. That was kind of like 
Um, what do I want to, to know about this? Ten years later, from a few weeks ago, I was listening to one of my favorite podcasts that you can actually choose in your weekly readings called Choiceology. Katie Milkman will talk about her amazing studies in the next time that we meet. Here's a bit more from him. The most famous example of a nudge probably is that they etched the image of houseflies in the urinals in the Amsterdam airport and reported, no one has been able to replicate this, <laughs> but they reported that... This is really important. You think this is a small statement? It is not. I'll tell you in a second why. No one has been able to replicate this. Let's continue. But still, 10 years after, this is the one thing that's mentioned. Spillage was reduced by 80%. So the lesson here is if you give a man a target, he will aim. A nudge is anything that attracts our attention and changes our behavior without changing monetary incentives or restricting choices. And do you have favorite examples of nudges besides the... Uh... Besides the Besides urinal? Besides the urinal what else? that have been big. <laughs> what else? Well, you know, the behavioral insights team and the uh, UK government <laughs> and some of the work they've done. So this is really interesting because Katie is one of the people who does amazing mega studies uh, showing all kinds of things about NUD. And even Katie asks him the very obvious question. is like, of all the things, you know, this is what it is. And they're joking about this. This is very important when we communicate to the public, what is it that we communicate? So has not been replicated of all the things that he could talk about. You know, she was saying behavioral insights in the UK, all the work that you've published, all the stuff that she's done. This is the one thing that you, that you raised. And this is 10 years after many, many times. There's another example. I won't go into this in too much detail, but I do want to open this up in case you want to listen to that podcast. So. Most people I mostly admire is also uh, terrific. It's the same people who do Freakonomics. And this is where he's uh, uh, interviewing Richard. Why he's such a something optimist, right? And then you can actually go here, uh, share the... And doesn't change economic incentives. And you'll hear him once again doing exactly the same thing, where they ask him, can you please give us... And, and this is, they're, they're like very close to one another. So even when he hears from somebody like Katie Milkman, please give us something else. This is his favorite story. Most recently, the book has been revised and got out a uh, uh, revised edition and still very prominently discusses that over there. Now, to me, uh, I, this bugged me for a very long time because I give courses about nudge. So I decided to publicly ask Cass Sunstein and Richard Tyler uh, whether there is some, um, I want to read the study. I really want to know how they measure the spillage. I want to know why this is a fly. I want to get in touch with the person who actually did this. And of course, I'm a nobody, so there's no reason why a, a Nobel laureate uh, will contact me. But I just wanted to know, has this ever been empirically tested or replicated in some, some scholarly work? So this, this is 2018, and I'm very happy. So Richard Tyler actually says now that this work has not been replicated. And he is a science writer. Um, and he says, you know, I've searched for this in the past without success. And then there's suggested there might be some ethical issues with this study. It seems like uh, something minor, but not for the number one thing that is behind a nudge. And I said, yeah, I don't understand why this is the centerpiece. And to my great surprise, even though he interviews with Katie Milkman and people I mostly admire, to my great surprise, I found a video of him giving a talk at the University of Chicago. And then just look at, I really like that, because in the slide, it already says something that I uh, was expecting to know when I read the book, but has never been shared before. Unverified effectiveness, 80% less uh, spillage. Now, I just want you to hear how he describes this. I feel it's important. Strongly recommend these talks. They're amazing. 
This is a urinal from the Amsterdam International Airport, and uh, some genius etched the image of a housefly, and they report, we've been unable to get the data, so this may not replicate, but they, uh, rep they claim spillage has been reduced by 80%. If any of you are... So we haven't been able to get the data for this, so I'm not sure this will replicate, but if you ask me about nudge, this is the one thing that I will show you, an added unverified effectiveness. Adding on top of that, since we said that maybe fly is not the obvious thing to say, are the parents of young boys, I hear Cheerios, can serve the same purpose. If you have young kids, then instead of a fly, you can just use Cheerios. Now, why am I taking the time to go through four different instances where Richard Tyler, the Nobel laureate, says this about nudge? What are your reactions to this? Hear it. Yes, please. Yes. So we don't have any data behind this 80%. Like you said, by now, we already know that this comes out of nowhere. We don't even know who the people are. We have no information about the data. He actually says, I don't know if this will replicate or not. I don't know what is going on with the study, but still uses this four times. So let's take this a step for, further. What am, what am I trying to say? What's your take from this? You want to say something? Kind of interesting, promotes his own study. Yeah, so we started out from him taking care of like salad, wanting us to be healthy. We're taking the scientific approach of we want to make people's lives healthier, we want to improve those, but then what we end up with are flies, right? And then to me, it kind of paints what it is that we're trying to do as scientists. We're trying to improve something. We're trying to offer an intervention. We're trying to do some, some good. Uh, and we want this to be backed by real evidence. We want to know that things actually work. And, and this creates, creates a problem. We'll actually come back to more instances of problems like that. But I feel it's very important that when you go and read information for your chapters, some people say it's been published in a book by the Nobel Prize laureate. Therefore, it must be true. I want you to ask questions about this, especially when it seems like a funky thing that might be a little bit more interesting. I want you to ask simple questions about what is going on in this kind of experiment. If you hear something from me that doesn't make sense to you, I want you to ask me, show me the evidence I want to see. How did you do this? What are the numbers? Who ran this? What time? I want you to be able to see every aspect of the study in order for you to know that you can trust it. For me, if it's unverified effectiveness, you putting this on a slide hurts the entire project of Nudge. Hurts the book, hurts all the people who good, do good work in this. If this is how you summarize things, and he's on the cover of, of, this, this, uh, of this movement, this nudge project. So to people who really care about nudge, to people who really care about evidence, this creates a big problem. And I think he's aware of this because he's slowly adopting the language of unverified, doesn't replicate. He is reacting to what is happening, but not to the extent that I would like this to go. So. I want you, every time you see a study, to go and actually look at the details in order to verify that this makes sense. So sometimes if you'll put stuff in the chapter saying, okay, this is just in the nudge book, and I'll ask you, did you go and have a look? Did you see the details? Do you know that this works? Did you go read the article? So how to make, <clears throat> make the differentiation between junk, and there is a lot of junk, even in academia, even by Nobel Prize winning books and scholars. And we need to be able to separate the junk from real evidence. So one of the things that we've been doing four years at HKU is revisiting many of these nudges in order to make sure that they're actually solid. See that there is real evidence, see that they reproduce, see that they replicate. 
in order to make sure. So many times when I see this kind of thing, I want to know more about what's behind this. So this is my main uh, message to you. Uh, we also have a uh, um, Google Doc manuscript uh, book that uh, we're trying to uh, work on in order to help you establish what is solid evidence. So even when it comes from a Nobel Prize winning scholar, even if it's in a very famous book, even if it's just revised a few months ago and came out, this does not mean that this is solid evidence. So check your evidence, check that there's a pre-registration, hopefully a registered report, and we'll talk about what that is. Make sure that there's open science, that you know where the data is, that you know who's behind this, that there's some uh, verification, and please avoid hype and unsupported uh, stories. Um, so I have many questions about this. This is an example of a good design. No, it is not a good design. Why? And these are some of the questions that I had about this. What makes this a good design? Why is this a fly? Did you taste different placements? Did you test different targets? What did you do? So actually, a few of us in the open science uh, judgment decision-making movement, we thought, let's say that we want to run this again as an experiment. Maybe we can talk to some of the HKU people and just like see what we can do with this. Um, but we have so many questions, we didn't even know where to, where to start with this. Uh, this is a little bit about uh, Richard. I, I won't go into this. Uh, I try to find a good summary of of what a nudge is, and I think I uh, gave you a little bit of that in the first uh, session. Every, almost every video that I saw on nudge is a little bit problematic, and I have a lot of questions on. But this is one of the better ones that I saw. Still, have a look at this and see what are the strengths and weaknesses in the way that this is framed here. This example because I think it's very important what this video is doing, trying to contrast nudge with what economists would usually try to do. So, what are the first two? Financially reward them by paying them into a supplementary pension program. So, there is a financial incentive, mandatory deduction of payment that's forcing people to do something, limiting their choices. So, this is economist, this is like policy, and we don't do that with nudge. Nudge is something about the choice architecture by simplifying it. So whenever you see a nudge, 
think about the contrast to what economists would do in this kind of situation and see which one is the most effective of those. Let's consider these three. Which one do you think is the most effective of these three? Let's say that we want people to save for retirement. What is the best way for us to do this? Which one would have the most uh, impact? Yeah, so your, your guess is on this one? Yeah. So why would this be the most uh, effective? Yeah, so at least at the very least, all of them will have to save. Yeah, what, why don't we do this? Why, why don't we just go for this? What's the problem with this one? If this is the most effective, why not implement this reactant? Yeah, so what, what could happen in this case? I, I, for example, at HKU have no choice. Also when I was in the Netherlands, also when I was in the US, automatically deducted from my salary going to um, pension fund. This is especially to me problematic because let's say when I moved from the Netherlands to Hong Kong, I can't take it out. I'm moving between countries. I don't know if I'll ever come to the Netherlands. 65, 67, I need to wait until I can come back to the Netherlands and claim that. This is just an example for how these are being done. Yeah? Sorry, you want to? Sorry, a what? Yeah, so, so let, let's talk about, you, you mentioned a lot of very good things. Let's, let's talk from the reactants. What kind of reactants can happen to this? It's mandatory, I have to do this. What, what's the possible reactant to this? Go on strike, okay, one, one good thing. This is like if you change from now to tomorrow, now you're saying everybody's mandatory, you can go on a strike, good. What, what else can you do? Okay, stopping other ways, saving. perhaps you found a, a better, more efficient way of saving, not through your employer who chooses whatever for everybody together. Good, maybe it's not the optimal choice. Yeah, so you stop that. Not exactly reactants, but it's less optimal than how you did this before that, right? What, what else is reactants? Maybe if you force me to have this kind of thing, maybe I wouldn't choose you as an employer. Maybe I would go to somebody else. Right? Maybe I will quit my job. It's a bit like a strike, right? So all kinds of, of, of things. Well, how about this, this uh, option over here? Why, why aren't we using this one? One other thing that HKU is doing, it's doing a matching scheme. So whatever it is that they're taking from me for pension, it's matched by the employer. So 100%. Let's say they're taking uh, uh, 2,000 Hong Kong dollars. They match this, so they double this, so it's 4,000 into the pension. So if I put 2,000, it becomes 4,000. I don't know why they would, wouldn't just give me 4,000 and then just take it out instead of telling me that they're doubling, but they're telling me that they're matching this. This is a matching scheme. So it's a little bit like a financial reward supplementary. Why not use the first one? In the, in the second one, we had reactants. What about this one? Yes, please. Higher cost financially, yeah. So there's definite downside to that. We need to prepare for it. Yeah. Good. Cost for the employer. Yeah. Not everybody reacts in the same way. Good. Yeah. So even when we consider nudge, and this is very common with behavioral economists and some of the psychologists, sometimes we need to consider all of these options together. So whatever it is that you're trying to do, Let's say you're trying to increase donations. Let's say that you're trying to address climate change. Whatever it is that you're trying to do, you need to think which one is going to be the most effective, what are the strengths, and what are the weaknesses for those, and then contrast them to each other. If you would have to guess, let's say you said this is the most effective of them, the nudge compared to the others, is it about the same double, half, What's your guess about nudge compared to the other two options in terms of influencing people's behavior? What kind of effects can we, let's say that before implementing any of those, 20% save for retirement, not, not talk about account, uh, amount, 20%. From 20%, we implemented this, or we implemented this, or we implemented this. What can we expect in terms of increasing from 20% to something higher? Have any predictions? If we do the mandatory reduction of payment from 22, let's say that it's 60, compared to the 60, from 20 to 60, let's take this as a reference number. What would be nudge 
About 40, about half? Good. So I want you to think about these things because we'll come to, to the evidence afterwards. And I think you'll be very surprised with the effects of each one of those and how Nudge compares to, to, to those. Uh, David Halpern is, uh, used to be uh, under Cameron in the UK, uh, the head of the behavioral insights teams. So the good thing about Cameron and Obama is that one of the first things that they did is that when they came in, they initiated in behavioral insights teams to try uh, nudging. I won't show you the, the video, but I recommend for you to go and listen to him. He does uh, really interesting stuff. We'll cover some of that in the next session where they run on the entire UK. They try all kinds of different interventions in order to see what works or not. So instead of a few politicians sitting together in a room and saying, huh, I think this is what people will do, they just do A-B testing in order to see, you know, if we randomize people or provinces or cities into different kind of intervention, what is going to be the impact for that? Okay, uh, another interesting example for a nudge, I, wanna, I want your take on this. Australia, take note, exercise equals a free ride in this city. As you can see, they've installed these machines over here where there is a camera. And if you do 16 or whatever, 20 squats in two minutes, you get a bus ride for free. This is what it looks like. Effective, not effective, interesting. Yeah, who are you trying to help? What are you trying to do, right? Yeah, so we're not sure whether the short-term intervention of something very quick before a bus ride is going to have long-term. Yeah, very good. So that's a good research question that we can ask. We can track them and see whether this has impact. Very good. Yeah, I think we can think of a lot of technical issues that can go wrong. Yeah, so something with implementation. This seems a little bit complicated, right? Not so simple like before. But at least it offers another, another, interesting, another interesting option. Um, but the things are much more uh, effective. Public pledges, implementation, intention. There's a very big debate, and some of you will have to tackle this in your chapters. In, um, when we want to increase charitable donation, do we want these charitable donations to be um, anonymous or public? There are different arguments. For example, if you go on, I don't know, what do you use? Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, whatever people use nowadays, and you see an influencer who said, I just donated 10% of all lifetime salary to effective altruism. Look at me, I'm this wonderful person. I have done this kind of thing. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? What, what do you gain yourself from this? Yeah, so I think we have a tendency, sometimes, especially when things regarding uh, morality, to be a little bit cynical and say, influencers are only doing this because this is how they'll get more followers or they'll get more likes and then people will think that they're better. So this is branding. But like you've mentioned, there's some amazing benefits to this. First of all, influencers are influencing others they're definitely role models. So if they do this kind of thing, perhaps they'll get others to do that as well. So there's something in that that is very, very powerful. And then you can get a large group of people rather than one specific person. So sometimes hiding your donations or hiding what it is that you do that is good is actually preventing a lot of good that you can do with making things public. So actually, I know a lot of uh, my friends when they see on Facebook or uh, Instagram, you know, this person is traveling a lot, or this person is doing all sorts of fun things. My God, he's showing off, she's showing off, they're trying to, to... But actually, I think this is good to remind people that there's travel out there that you need to care about, work-life balance, perhaps inspire you to go and look at uh, a vacation. Of course, there's a lot of 
jealousy and envy and why is my life like this compared to other people so there's lots of stuff about you know seeing all this perfection out there that's in Israel but at least it does influence us to consider these kinds of things. And when it comes to moral related uh, issues like charitable donations, it might get us to donate. Yeah, there's a whole debate in uh, psychology, definitely in philosophy on what is it to be altruistic. Um, I can tell you growing up, I grew up in Israel, Judaism and all of that, that if you look at the text in the Old Testament, in all the Jewish scriptures, it's all about you know, you need to be humble. Give donations where nobody else is knowing. This is the real, the real moral person is the person who does not publicize their good deeds. You know, this is kind of thing. And I think there's similar things in Christianity, in Islam, in Buddhism, and so forth. So be humble about the good things that you do in life. Actually, these kind of things suggest that sometimes it's good to share with others. You don't need to, you know, over uh, do it. But sometimes it is good because the amount of good that you can do in the world by others doing and um, doing similar things in their life is actually, is actually creating more of an impact for you. The second thing which I think you touched on but uh, didn't quite go there is that it also has implications for the actual person. So can you imagine an influencer saying, I'm going to donate 10% of my salary for effective altruism from now until I'm dead. But then two years later, it's like, ah, uh, things are a bit tight right now. I don't feel like the 10% is just going to stop it. People are going to be upset. It's going to be a story. So there is something about public commitment. You saying this publicly is making sure that others can hold you accountable for this. So if you just Keep this to yourself. You know, this is a personal deed. I donated some charity and, and all of that. If you want to stop it, you stop it and nobody actually knows. And then it's very easy to convince yourself, okay, now I have, you know, kids and now my wife and all of that. But if you make this publicly, a public pledge, then it enforces accountability, public accountability. So it's much more difficult for you to retract from that after you, you've done this publicly. So very, very uh, important uh, tool. I'm going to give you some uh, things for, you know, examples of nudging. You tell me if this is a nudge or not. Is this a good nudge or not a good nudge? Join the 8 out of 10 people who don't smoke. Effective, not effective? Effective, why? If others are doing this, then I must do this uh, uh, as well. Smoking, I think, is a little bit more complicated than that. So I've seen this uh, implemented, at least by some studies, let's say in a hotel room. If you go to the hotels, it says people who have stayed in this room keep, keep their towels longer or don't use as much uh, paper or do all sorts of things that are more green. You know? So if you keep the towel on the rack, then we don't wash it. If you throw it on the floor, most of the people that are in this room keep it on the rack. So I think in this kind of context, maybe a little bit better. With smoking, I think it's just such a habit that it's going to be a bit more problematic. Uh, text messages to remind you about a doctor's appointment. So text reminders about all sorts of things. I can't read this. Maybe some of you can. Text reminders. What do you think? Effective, not effective? Yeah, it seems to be effective. I'll show you some of the studies, mega studies that have been done on this. We talked about this. Here's a little bit more. You know, stand a bit closer to the... So lots of things to improve about men's urinals. I'm just not sure that this is the right, the right way to do it. You talked about the soccer. Actually, there's, I don't know if you can see the way you can actually score and do all sorts of things in there. You know what this is? Yeah, in this, in this case, it's like tipping. So people who want tips, you know, they want to give tipping. So. They're making this into a competition about do you prefer the Beatles or the Rolling Stones? I don't, your generation may be not familiar. What is it going to be now? Uh, DC, Marvel? I don't know. It's like we can think about, but this seems to be something that uh, creates all sorts of interesting nudging. I don't know if we can make this into a public policy, <laughs> but at least for tipping, this seems to do all sorts of things. Don't touch my lunch in a fridge. For some reason, people describe this as a nudge, whatever. Just have <laughs> some, something that makes it look like a, as if it's bad, like anti-theft lunch bags. I don't get this. 
Other things, I would like to be assisted. I would like to shop on my own. Effective, not effective. I actually like this. So this is very simple, very clever, and it solves an important issue. So this is this one is, uh, is quite terrific. Um, what else? This is this is clever. So condoms and huggies for kids. Like which one? are you going for uh and the condoms cost less so, um okay answer them now this is interesting what's your opinion on this how to get people to put the thermostat on something that doesn't make the aircon work all the time so how to get people to choose the right setting on a thermostat uh nowadays it's a bit more electric back in my day it was just like a one to five and people, you know, you have to play with this. And then people are just like, go over the top. And sometimes people argue, this is an actual paper from 2009, saying, just put a marker, you know, tell people where to put the thermostat. Effective or not effective? Could be effective. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, especially when there's uncertainty. Especially if it's your first time. It might be a little bit uh, helpful. Yeah, social information seems to be, it's actually a very good question to ask whether by doing this kind of policy, you're actually hurting yourself some other way in people doubting your credibility. Very good point. Yeah. So in your chapters, when you talk about these kinds of things, I want you to reflect on these, on these topics. I want you to think about these, the weaknesses and the strength of each one of these things and the possible issues, technical issues, to behavioral issues, to all sorts of implementation um, dilemmas that we might have with these. This is an interesting one. Uh, so when I talked about behavioral insights teams uh, in the UK and uh, a little bit later during the, very, uh, there, during the Obama administration, we have some uh, insights coming about uh, you know, compliance. So even something like telling others for paying taxes, you know, um, nine out of 10, so you're asking, 10, eight out of 10, you're coming in, nine out of 10. So they've done this with taxes, telling them, and it could be a lie, nine out of 10 people in your country postcode town uh, pay their taxes on time, pay your taxes on time. And the control condition, which is very important, we need a neutral condition with no manipulation like this, 67% did this. When you gave them the country, 72.5%, and then increasing to 79, and then 83. If you think about this in a country level, especially a country like the UK and the US, these are gigantic numbers. This is such a big impact. This is, to me, almost too good to be true. If this would be an academic study, I'm like, I don't know what's going on here. Like, I need to see this again. So these are behavioral insights teams that work for the government and work on a country level. So if we have nudges that work this well, then I feel like we should do this a lot more, at least try this out as much as possible. We do need to consider what it means and where the statistics actually come from. But at least here, the manipulation was, regardless of the actual <laughs> numbers, we're going to tell people what they do, how they react afterwards. We still need to study that sort of thing. But this is a really interesting. Now, in 2000 and, uh, 2020 and 2021, we set out in my courses. So in 2020, we set out to, now we're actually doing these two. Actually, we're doing all three. Yeah, we're actually running these three as replication. Um, so we're looking at yeah, attribute framing. So for example, uh, whether you frame something as a tax or as an offset. So if you want people to choose the, um, carbon offset in flights. So you can pay a little bit more in order to offset your carbon in, um, footprint. If you frame this as a carbon offset versus you frame this as a carbon tax. So a very simple manipulation of one word. To me, this almost seemed like too good to be true. So we're actually running a replication on this. So what we do is that we prepare a pre-registration plan. We send this to the journal. Actually, we had uh, Hardesty comment as one of the reviewers to tell us whether our design is good or not. And we're going to collect data in about a month and then finish and see whether this actually holds or not. 
the other two we're also running and also in revise and resubmit. So this is 2020. As you can see, a lot of things take a lot of time, especially because COVID related stuff. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the default effects that we ran already, but we wanted to run a bit more defaults, green defaults, um, and then uh, gains from losses, so framing effects. We wanted to see this too, and I'll show you why. Allegedly, one of the strongest effects in nudging, which I really wanted to confirm together with HQ students, is defaults. I only recommend this book. I listened to it as a podcast, The Elements of Choice. Uh, some of it is assigned uh, reading. You can choose this if you want to, if this is interesting for you. Um, the person who ran a lot of default related studies, so Eric Johnson, a uh, very prominent uh, figure, published a lot, did a lot, and generally very impactful in our field. Default save lives. So if you go to the nudge, uh, book. This is their argument for uh, nudge. So this was published in Science in 2003. So it doesn't happen very often that economists and social psychologists uh, publish in Science. But what they actually showed is that it depends what the default is for organ donation. So organ donation can have very high rates or very low rates. So if you look at the countries on the left, Denmark, Netherlands, UK, Germany, the rates of organ donation are very, very low, under 20%. If you look at the ones on the right, Austria, Belgium, France, Hungary, Poland, Portugal, Sweden, very high, about 80%, 80%. What are the differences between these and these ones? Opt in and opt out. Because if you, some people would say it's culture. Actually, if you look at these collection of countries, Belgium and the Netherlands, uh, half of Belgium is very close to the Netherlands, the Flemish uh, one. You've got ones that are very close to, to one another, so you can make some uh, comparisons between, like, say, Sweden and Denmark. So it doesn't seem to be solely about culture. Definitely would not explain these kinds of differences. The main difference was that in these countries, first you're enrolled as an organ don uh, donor, and if you don't want to be, then you need to have a process in order to get out of this. Whereas here, you're assumed not to be an organ donor unless you opt in and you say that you want to. So this seems very convincing, right? So a very prominent paper has been cited many, many times. Going back to Tyler, I was just like my mind blown from this lecture for so many other things, not just because he was saying that uh, it's unverified evidence, but I wanted him to reflect on this figure that he put in Nudge and has been revised in a recent uh, book edition, but hasn't communicated this. So basically what he says was, presumed consent reduces organ transplant, which is exactly the opposite from this graph. What he shows over here is the opt-in is higher than opt-out is lower. I'll let you him say this to you in person <laughs> in the video. Now, most of you are young. Imagine what inference your parents would take from your failure to fill in some form. Probably none. And that would probably be accurate, right? Our failures of omission are not very telling about our underlying preferences. Well, does presumed consent save lives? No. Consent. So the bar on the graph is organs transplanted per 100,000 deaths uh, in opt-in countries. The one on the right is opt-out countries. The higher is better. This is the real graph. It's not famous. This is the real graph but it's not famous, which is exactly the opposite graph from what it is that we've been communicated in Nudge. Turns out that having the consent, in this case, it's not the consent, it's the lack of, does not mean that you can be used as an organ donor. Actually, when you pass away, they come to your family and say, he has consented, she has consented to donate in their organs. Therefore, we're going to do this. And turns out 
But for these folks who actually made the choice, the family would say, oh, he made the choice, she made the choice, of course, go ahead with this. But if the default here, then actually the family says, no, I, I don't think this was not a choice. This is because he made a policy. So it drops, the actual rates drop from 80 to 100% uh, to 20 lower than the other one. It's completely remarkable because this is not communicated. So the actual graph is this. So sometimes you need to be very, very careful. You think you know something about opt-in, opt-out. Actually, defaults work here, and they work in the unintended way. So blows my mind, which kind of gets to the point of, like, we need to know what replicates and what doesn't replicate. <clears throat> a meta-analysis, which we think is a good or overview of whether something works or doesn't work. When and why default influence decisions, a meta-analysis of default effects. So showing a coherence Z of 0 0.68, 73,000 people, a lot of people, very famous people like Eric Johnson, um, <clears throat> published in a reputable uh, uh, journal saying, you know, it's uh, the reason why defaults work. One of the main reasons is that what the choice, it reflects what the choice architect thinks the right decision is. So when people see that the default is to do something, they just assume, oh, somebody who's clever suggests this to me, therefore I should follow their advice. Now, to me, this was a little bit uh, eerie. <clears throat> I never quite understood. So I wanted to see what that looks like. So together with uh, all the HKU students, one of them is a PhD student now, a lot of them are master students now. So they took this as a, we had two teams of two students working independently, <clears throat> teaching assistants. And then finally, after they finished, I got Prasad to come in, integrate everything together and bring this to publication. So finally, it is published this year. And we wanted to understand what does that look like? So what does opt-in, opt-out look like? And this is what it looks like. So we actually took this from <clears throat> the science paper in 2003, two studies by Johnson, Johnson and colleagues, 2003, 2002. This is the first one. You have an opt-out, so automatically the yes, See how slight this is? Automatically it's no. And in the control condition, no default, nothing is chosen. So we wanted to know if this works or not. <clears throat> in the other study in 2002, they made this more complicated. This is what they gave. <clears throat> uh, notify me about more health uh, surveys or send me more information about organ donation. Now, not only did they manipulate opt-in and opt out, but they also added positive frame and negative frame. What does that look like? Positive frame is what we is natural to us. Send me more information about organ donation. Yes, no, or no option. Now this is where it becomes complicated. What is the negative frame? Do not send me more information about organ donation. Yes, no. When I see this kind of question, I don't really know what that means. So if I select yes or I select no, does this counter that do not? Unclear. So I really wanted to like do a replication of this to see uh, what happens. In the first one, we actually got not exactly the same uh, findings, but very similar findings. So this is our uh, neutral compared to this neutral. This is opt-in. So our opt-in, 62 compared to 42. So you can see the increase in opt-out, which here was 82 compared to 74. So actually, this is a successful replication. So this is good to know. Now we've seen that HQU students can replicate these kinds of findings. So this is a good thing about the default. However, our replication of the 2002 <clears throat> with a positive and negative framing, Actually, they did not find any differences between the positive and the, and the negative. At least it's not, it's not very uh, strong, but we found very extreme differences between negative and positive, but we did not find very uh, large or any differences in the, um, in the differences between the defaults. And the conclusion for all of that is that actually one is successful, but a little bit weaker than what they published, and one is unsuccessful because if you do positive, negative versus default, 
actually framing of things, so positive, negative, completely overwhelm. See, this is the original, so they found no effect for positive, negative. We found very strong effect, positive, negative. But actually, we found effects that are uh, overlapping with the null, but in the opposite direction. What to make of this? But it's very difficult to argue that there's a problem with our study because the first one and the second one were in the same data collection and one worked and one didn't work. So it's not about that the sample is bad or there's something about the context. There is something very puzzling about this study, especially with these framings of do not, do not. <clears throat> so even when you see a study and you think, yeah, it's been communicated, published, best journals in a book, uh, and we should implement policy, sometimes you want to contrast two different effects, negative, positive versus default, and see which one of them works. And not everything is to be taken for granted. I don't know what is causing this. We'll look into this. But it's a contribution of HQ students to the issue of, of defaults. When you go and you look for information about what works and what doesn't work, uh, I suggest that you look at the meta-analyses of all kinds of intervention. So disclosure, feedback, pre-commitment, reminders, text uh, simplification. And as you'll see, if we compare all of these, it seems like the evidence for defaults is a little bit higher than the rest. If we look at the changes, many of them do not overlap with zero. So it means that there is some effect, but the effects are not 40%, they're not 60%. They're kind of like around the 20, the only one that comes close to, to 40% that was mentioned here before, so like a 20% increase on 20%. For 40% is the default, but even then you can see the ranges are very, very uh, large in the, in the effects over here. So, you want to look at your chapter or whatever the intervention is that you do and compare this to some of the others in order to know what works or not. Preferably in more than just one study. So another example, a meta-analysis of choice architecture interventions across behavioral domains. Once again, we have all sorts of things about the actual decision information, visibility, social reference. We have things about decision structure, default. Once again, one of the higher the bigger effects, so 0.62 compared to all the others, this is dominating. And then decision assistance, whether this is a reminder or a pre-commitment. And then look at the effects to see which one seems to be the strongest or which category seems to be the strongest. And then based on that, try and aim for a certain category. Or let's say that you are in a category and try to see inside the category which one seems to be the most effective. So for example, if you're over here, maybe aim for the default, but not for the consequence. If it's here, perhaps social reference. So try and evaluate what is the impact? What is the effectiveness? How do we know? And use meta-analysis with as much information as possible about the effect. Uh, possibly two different meta-analysis that would confirm uh, the same kind of finding. So what converges around these two is definitely the default seems to be one of the strongest uh, effects. Now, this was published in PNAS. <clears throat> if you thought that, okay, there's a meta-analysis and now everything is clear and now we know how to do our chapter. <laughs> so not only am I going to, you know, reverse urinals and default effects by having the uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, scholar to tell you that there's the problem, but a lot of criticisms came out of this uh, two meta-analyses. This is one of them. I actually know many of them. Max actually works with us and with our HKU students, and he does a meta-analysis. And what they've done, they've uh, implemented something called the uh, ROBMA, which is a new Bayesian analysis of a meta-analysis. And what they found is no evidence for nudging after adjusting for publication bias. So basically what they're saying is that only the studies that work were published, but there's lots of studies that don't work, and we can actually detect it using a Bayesian analysis. So they reran the meta-analysis using exactly the same data, and this is what they found in the different domains. Different, it's very, very close to zero. 
So even after you see a meta-analysis like this, and you're saying, okay, problem solved, this is PNAS top journal from 2022, so just published recently. Therefore, we must implement defaults because this is the best. Terrific. Are there any criticisms on that? Yes, so include the criticism. Is there more than one criticism? Yes, there's more than one criticism. I actually also know this group. So a lot of people in this group, one of them is a very famous statistician that blogs about open science and they need to uh, compensate for all of this uh, publication bias. So after adjusting for hypoth uh, hypothesis severe to moderate degree of publication bias, adjusted estimates average effect size of nudges is between very, very weak to moderate. So it's not like everything disappears, but we need to be a bit more humble about things. And we need to take into account publication bias. So in this course, usually in judgment decision-making, behavioral economics, you will hear a professor come and tell you, do this, do that, read this book, read, follow everything that those things say. I want to tell you that we pursue scientific truth. We need to be very humble. We need to be able to evaluate evidence. And we evaluate evidence by reading all the evidence, not only the first publications uh, that found something, but also some of the criticisms, trying to address those. And then, with humility, with adjusting for publication bias, understanding that actually nudges have probably some kind of impact, but it's much weaker than we uh, initially thought. So it's not the 0 0.68 for um, default that we, that we imagined. Finally, yeah, we have uh, two more minutes. It seems like when we run large scale uh, studies and we try to nudge for good, so we try to nudge for addressing climate change, it seems like there is some, of, uh, some effect. But the reason why some of these effects uh, come and go is because there are some moderating factors. So it could be that green default of, uh, what was it, uh, motivating for environmental behaviors uh, happen under a certain price range. So here they're using defaults in order to get people to what was it, I think, uh, offsetting? Yeah. Um, so it seems like it's working, but it's only working for tickets up to a certain amount of money. So it's really interesting to see some of these. It's good to not only go for meta-analysis, but also look at the latest evidence that comes from big, you know, 11,000, big sample, 11,000 participants in this study, and then see whether there's some moderation so I really like this because this is in the field on real participants, a very large sample, and it shows us some kind of pattern that helps understand a little bit better what happened in the, in the meta-analysis. Green defaults, another one that's very uh, big. So can we reduce meat consumption? Honestly, I'm skeptical. Um, I've tried for a very long time throughout my life to do this. Finally, this. COVID helped me, so two years vegetarian, but still struggling with this kind of thing. I know how difficult it is to reduce meat consumption, especially in a place like Hong Kong, with the ducks hanging by their necks in every street corner. But it's interesting that they've actually been able to succeed to some extent, uh, maybe not in complete meat consumption, but there's a bit more reduction in portion size with one of the studies going as far as almost 90%. So. Even something as simple as default, having the default of how much meat you would consume. So I think you said plates, large plates, small plates. This is the stuff that I would talk about more than, let's say, urinals in the toilet. So it's really interesting when you look at the evidence for your chapter to try and find some of these direct interventions with large samples, looking at things that uh, try to create uh, some good. I'm not going to do this. Uh, there's a video over here. Uh, two minutes or more, Richard Thaler saying that actually, when we have urgent challenges like climate change, he says, we can do nudge, but it will do this much. We really want to address this. We need to go mandatory, and we need to put some penalties and incentives into it. So even a behavioral economist says, nudging is okay. We can try and play with this 5% here, 10% there. But when it comes to addressing climate change, 
doing all sorts of things with uh, green meat consumption, animal welfare, all these other things in order to reduce carbon emissions and get our planet back to um, on track, then we really need to go back to the hardcore economic view of using two of the other options, not just not but complementing this with mandatory and incentive. So this is a very brief critical summary of nudge some good things about nudge but there's lots of things that we need to tackle can we do better with nudge we talked a lot about the weaknesses here we can do better and we'll show you how to do better katie milkman is one of the people who are doing better so i was hoping that this would be next week but because we have a, a public holiday it will be in three weeks there is a way to do nudging well and learn from that for COVID, for uh, going to the gym, for getting vaccinations, uh, flu shots, and so, so forth. Uh, but I did want you to get the critical view first before we see how best practices are implemented in our field, including some of the things that we participated in in the last two years. If you have any questions, I'm looking forward to your questions on Slack. Feel free to ask as much as possible. Uh, finish your contract and then get started on your chapters. I'll see you in three weeks.